Okay, so um, I'm extremely honored uh, to be here uh, with you and, and meet with you. I have um, an amazing respect for uh, the Nextcloud community and what the Nextcloud community does. Um, so it really is an honor to be here. And, and you will see why I have such an honor. I will explain that to you uh, during this pre presentation uh, this morning. So uh, three things to summarize uh, who I am and what I have done. Uh, first, uh, the little furry logo on the, the left side is uh, Firefox. I have spent uh, 17 years of my life uh, devoted to the uh, Mozilla project. Uh, it started, well, when it started, I was lucky enough to be an employee of an a internet startup that was called Netscape back in the days. Uh, well, I started back in 97, and uh, in 98, I, was, uh, I had the honor to introduce the Mozilla project to the world because I was in charge of PR in Europe, and nobody at the time understood what open source was about, and they, they just thought it was like f software you didn't have to pay for, and that was all. And, and so um, it happened that I already knew Richard Stallman from before, and so I volunteered to be the guy uh, to uh, help with the Mozilla project to be uh, known in Europe. And after that, I uh, founded Mozilla Europe. Uh, I was the president of Mozilla Europe for nine years. Um, and after 17 years in the same project, uh, with uh, high and lows and happiness and less happy times, uh, I decided to do something else. So uh, I took, uh, well, I decided to leave Mozilla. I, I still call myself a Mozillian. I, still, I am still involved with Mozilla as a volunteer, uh, but I'm not a paid employee anymore. And so I decided to write uh, a book, which is called uh, Surveillance. And Pretty much, this is what we are going to discuss today, this morning, this book, Surveillance. Uh, to my surprise, it's selling really well. Uh, my publisher announced me that, uh, earlier in the month that they would do another reprint of the book. So it's the third time it's being printed, uh, which, which I can't understand. But, well, uh, it's, a, it's a good surprise because, it's, I, in my opinion, it's a, it's a very important topic. Um, and finally, I have joined uh, Cozy Cloud, which is a, an open source project uh, that is similar in some ways uh, to uh, Nextcloud, which is based uh, in, in Paris, uh, France. And I will explain you why I, I'm interested in, in all of this, because I think it really matters. Uh, so we'll start with some history. Uh, this is one of the first machines I owned back in the days. Um, and so this is an Apple, Apple II, which is, um, when compared to uh, an iPhone, is extremely different because it's open first. Um, you see, uh, you could open it. You have some uh, Velcro stuff to open it and close it. No, no tools needed to open, which, you know, in, in, with the notion of a... An Apple device is extremely strange um, now uh, nowadays, but at the time it was really open, it was hackable. It's different also from such devices in, because all the data that you wanted to put in, you had to type it with the keyboard. Like now, there, you know, it's, it's different because the data is generated by this thing. Just moving the thing is generating data because you have sensors now in smartphones. But at the time, if you wanted data to be in the computer, you had to type it with your hands. Um, and also you had to write the software because there is no software available. Uh, so that was really the uh, early beginning of personal computing. Um, and do you know the difference between uh, these two, I don't know how to call them, 
not vultures, but uh, well, the one on the left is a vulture, and uh, it's from California. It's a California condor, and on the right, uh, it's a California uh, not vulture. No, no, that's not right. He's dead anyway. Uh, so that's Steve Jobs, um, and actually, uh, Steve Jobs, and so it's it's barely readable, but. Uh, it was, it was a very interesting thing that Steve Jobs said, uh, that, that the human are different from the, the big, uh, is it primates? Uh, yes, is, is that we build, as humans, we build tools. And they made a comparison on what is uh, the most efficient animal to move for one kilometer. And the, the, the animal which is the best at the game is the condor. When it flies, it, can, it saves energy a lot, so it, can, it takes little energy to move to one kilometer. And the, uh, the human is not really good at that, unless you put the human on a bicycle. And then he changes everything, and finally, thanks to the tool, the human becomes the best at the game. And Steve Jobs explained that uh, the computer is a bicycle for the mind. It's the tool that expands the mind and does more. Um, so that's, that's the key thing. It's that the, uh, the computer is the bicycle for the mind. Um, and sorry for stating the obvious, but the computer is something which is totally useless unless you have software. And in 1999, I mean, I'm keeping with the history thing. Uh, this is Larry Lessig. Um, he wrote that code is law because the person who writes the code is the person who uh, decides what the user can do and cannot do with the computer or with that mind bicycle. Um, and if you don't have open source, free software, uh, and access to the code and the, the right to change and edit and uh, all the code, then you don't have freedom in the digital world means that some, someone else is writing the code for you and that someone else is deciding what you can do or cannot do. So this is, a, this is extremely uh, uh, important to uh, remember. Uh, I'm sure you all do because you write open source code, but it, it needs to be reminded constantly to ordinary people who forget, you know, they get, they get devices and they don't realize that the code that is, is important is not always open. Uh, in the year, uh, years 2000, and, uh, something very significant happened uh, is what people call cloud computing uh, because, well, that's not the, re the best way to describe it. I would rather say software as a service. And they all use software as a service with the Dropbox and Google Maps, Gmail, Office 365, Facebook, Evernote, uh, anything. It's really uh, is very interesting. Uh, it runs on the server. You need to have a web browser, and that's all you need, just a web browser. Uh, and you can use the software. And, and you don't have to install anything apart from the web browser that anyway bundles with your computer. Um, that's really nice from a user standpoint. Uh, now there is a significant issue with that, is uh, with this, you don't have control over the software that you use. You do not have, generally, access to the server, and you, don't, you can't change the software on the server. Can you change Google Maps? No. Can you change Gmail? No. Can you prevent it from reading your email? No. That's the way it is because you do not have control over the software that runs on the server. So that's a, that's a very significant issue. Um, in, in 2007, um, something interesting happened. That was uh, the birth of the smartphone. And, and I'm sorry, it looks like I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Steve Jobs, which is not the case, but uh, anyway. Um, so the smartphone is always connected. It's still a computer, but it's always connected um, unless you really need it. When you really need it, I don't know if you've seen that, but it always fails. But that, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Um, 
the difference with the initial Apple II, apart from that, is it's full of sensors. This thing generates data like an Apple II, well, much more than an Apple II, because you can take picture with it, it has tons of sensors, a camera, microphone, accelerometer, compass, uh, all of that, and it generates data and sends it to the internet. And you always have it with you, and it's always on. And these things sell more than PCs for four years now. Since 2013, smartphones are more popular than PCs. The PC is slowly dying, and the smartphone is still uh, growing. It's growing f not as fast as before, but still, still growing. And now, today, people use three kinds of computer. The PC, and not all, not all people use a PC now. Uh, uh, smartphones and clouds. That's, that's a fact of life. We all have three different kinds of computers. But there are a few things about the cloud that is not being said, and I think we need to say it to, uh, to the world. The first one is uh, actually, uh, it's, it's a German uh, slogan from the uh, Free Software Europe. There is no cloud, just someone else's computer. Remember that. If you use the cloud, it's not your computer. You don't have control over it. And, and so someone decides what you can do or cannot do. I mean, Gmail would be totally fine if Google didn't read my email. G Google Maps would be totally fine. It's a great piece of software. Okay, if I could change it. Um, and another thing is that many people think that data is the oil of the 21st century. That's what they have in mind, and so they do stuff. They come and pump the data, pump that digital oil directly from our pockets. So I'm, I'm sorry, the screenshot on the right is in French. It was on my Android phone back in the days when I used Android. Um, and I wanted to use Facebook, and so I started installing Facebook. And this is the list of things this piece of software wants. And it's amazing. So let's review this uh, history of apps and, uh, and device, um, identity, uh, my calendar. Why the fuck does it want access to my calendar? I mean, seriously, people, why? And, and contacts, so this I know because it takes my contacts and uploads it immediately to Facebook. Uh, in order to create uh, shadow accounts for future users. Um, position, GPS position, why? But why does he want me to know where I am? He wants to read my text messages and know who I have called and access to all my files, photos, and, and movies. And then there's this green button that says accept. Like it's green like a green light. It's like, like green, like hope. Yes. And no. I mean, I mean no. I cannot, I cannot accept to do that. I, I just did not click on that thing. You know, I, I stopped the application and never run it again. I am not willing to surrender all my data for, for what? Kittens. I mean, I love kittens, but I don't need to surrender that data to see kittens and, and, and see the things and, and exchange and, and talk to my friends, right? And so you, know, you people say, yeah, but you know that Tristan Lido guy, he doesn't like Facebook. True, but Google either. So this is Google Maps. Well, actually, this is data on Google server because I use Google Maps. So that was uh, on uh, 2nd of December uh, 2014, was it? I don't know. Yes, that's, that's the day I decided to write my book. And so there were, and, and this, is, this is Paris, and this is all the data points of where I was that, on that day in Paris. There are moments where there are lines it's because it cannot track me in the metro yet, but they're working on it, right? So, and, and this is on Google's server for every day of my life, because I have an Android, I had an Android phone at the time. And so Google, yeah, is, is tracking me on everything that I do. 
And there's that question. Are we really the clients, the customers of these internet giants? And so I will, uh, I'll show you a photo of two of my friends. These are Alice and Bob. Uh, Alice is on the left, Bob is on the right. Um, and they are really cool pigs. And, and Alice says to Bob, you know, Bob, I love this place. I love this place because the food is free. And Bob said, yeah, yeah, Alice, you're totally right. The food is free, the place is amazing, and you know what? The lodging is free. We can sleep here for free. This is so amazing. Until you realize that this is not a gift that the farmer is doing to pigs, right? It is not a gift. The pigs are going to end up in French or German sausage, right? And this is exactly what happens, except that normally Google will not slice Louis into pieces, neither Facebook, as far as I know. Uh, but the truth is, they are like farmers to us. We are not the customers. The pigs are not the clients, the customers of the farmer, right? We all know that. And some, and, and some people stop eating food, and, or at least eating uh, meat and pork for that very reason. And in, in, in the cyber world, if you will, the, the users of Google and Facebook are not the clients of users. Uh, um, it's not the clients of Google and Facebook. We are the thing that they sell to the actual clients, and the actual clients are the advertisers. So this is something we need to tell to the world because people don't get it. They do, they do get it about the pigs and the cows and the chickens and all of that, but about Google and Facebook, they don't get it. And the worst is that we get a terrible deal, right? Um, I, I did the math and, and if you uh, go to uh, public uh, information about Facebook, and, and you see the amount of money they spend every year and the number of uh, users that they have, you do the math, it's easy to do and you see that for a sl slightly more than three euros a year they can provide. It's, it's the cost of providing the Facebook service for one person. And of course they make a lot more money about that uh, from each of us. So all your data yet you give up it's only for 3.33 euros a year. That's a terrible deal. So uh, this is Edward Snowden, a uh, whistleblower um, who uh, blew the whistle in June 2013. He was a CIA employee and then he was an NSA uh, contractor. Uh, NSA uh, stands for National Security Agency in the US, uh, which uh, goal is basically uh, to do mass surveillance on the world. Um, here are a few slides that you can find on Wikipedia um, that were revealed by Edward Snowden. Uh, so on the right is uh, just a, an example, it's called Dropout Jeep. So basically Edward Snowden was, was an American patriot and was extremely concerned to see that the NSA, his employer, was doing things that were illegal in the US. And as, as a citizen and a patriot, he could not stand, he could not accept that, he could not work, he couldn't see his employer, couldn't accept his employer would violate the American Constitution. Um, and so he decided to give Tons of documents he had found on servers because he was a sysadmin of the servers. And so he took a lot of PowerPoint documents and gave it to uh, reporters in June 2013. And, and so to drop out Jeep on the right is basically, uh, it's malware you can be installed on iPhones and pretty much collect all data and send it back encrypted, encrypted to the NSA. Um, um, on the left, top left, is a, is a magnificent post-it note uh, where they explain how uh, they manage to hack the Google servers and access data so that they can have 
gather information at pretty much every Google user. On the bottom left is actually, and I'm sorry you can't see it better, um, this is how they collect data from cables that run under the ocean. And if, if you could zoom on it, you would see that in France, in the south of France, in Marseille, there is a spot where there's a cable starts and heads to Singapore. And it goes, of course, through all the Middle East countries where they connect to the internet and they listen to the traffic on that cable and sort it and copy it, analyze it. So there were thousands of documents like that in the Snowden revelations. And we're still discovering new stuff and you see new articles about it. And, and it, it basically, it comes down to one thing. The NSA wants to listen to every communication, phone or computer, of everyone in their planet. And it would be extremely costly to do it, but what we do is really crazy because we put all our data in the hands of a handful of companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. Just like these huge silos here, we put data in a handful of places. And so we're making the NSA's work a lot easier by centralizing this. So in short, the Snowden revelation explained us that centralizing data is what makes mass surveillance economically possible. If we own, if we had our uh, clouds, personal clouds, each of us, would be extremely complicated for the NSA to create mass surveillance. It would be too expensive. They wouldn't do it. But because we centralize data, it's possible. And, and, and yet, usually, I hear always the same answer. Yeah, but, you know, I have nothing to hide. So why do I care? Think about it. Does it matter? I think it does. Mass surveillance is toxic for democracy and freedom. And I'm going to explain this to you, why it is. Because when we are under surveillance, we tend to change our behavior. We tend to self-censor. And in many cases, we refuse to acknowledge this. But we actually, we do. There was a very interesting study that shows that if you ask people if they change their behavior when they are under surveillance, and the more the people say, no, I do not, I really do not change my behavior, the more they do when you put them under surveillance. That's, that's really, uh, that's uh, mind-boggling. Um, so here's a, a concept called the panopticon um, that was studied by a French, well, a couple of French philosophers, uh, Foucault, uh, in, a, in a great book, uh, explained uh, how, when under surveillance, we, we change our behavior. And, and this, is, this is a prison in Cuba. Uh, it's, it's an old prison, so uh, imagine it's, it's a circle. And cells are the, in the, around this, and in the center, there is a tower. In the tower, there's a one guard, or a couple of guards. And they're, they are looking at the prisoners. And the thing is, because this, the, the windows are really small, you never know if you're being surveyed or not at one time. You know there is someone. He may be looking at you, maybe not. But you stay quiet, because otherwise you get into trouble if you do, you know, noise or stuff. And the beauty is, the guard can go and, I don't know, go to the restroom or get a sandwich, and you still behave correctly because you think you're under surveillance, even though you're not. So this is explained by a French uh, philosopher uh, Foucault and also uh, Deleuze, 
Gilles Deleuze, uh, who basically explained that this notion of panopticon, this, the, the way that you can survey everyone from a single place, which, could, which has been applied uh, by, uh, it was invented actually by uh, um, uh, English philosophers uh, back in the uh, uh, 19th century. They invented it for prisons and they also invented factories so they could survey uh, workers. Make sure they didn't steal stuff. Um, and basically this panopticon thing, it's not to see without being seen, it is to, be, to impose specific behavior to a human group. Because if you know you are under surveillance, you tend to behave like you are expected to behave. And, and there is an example, a real case study uh, about that. This is the number of page views for Wikipedia US pages that are related to terrorism, which is a very important topic. We talk so much about terrorism, and you hear about it in the news, and you especially in the cable news, all, always the same thing, you, know, you see pretty much nothing. You see cops, you see fire, you see dead bodies over and over. Little, very little room for thinking and explanation because they know nothing, they're just reporting as it happens. Um, and so people go to Wikipedia to read about terrorism. And it's good. I mean, citizens could go and fetch information from Wikipedia about that. It is absolutely legal to go to Wikipedia, and I think it would be recommended to learn more about terrorism to understand the issue because it is so important in our society today. And so, so as you can see, over time, people go more and more and visit more and more the, these pages in Wikipedia about terrorism. And it's good. And it increases, as you see, the, the, the black bar, it's, it's getting more and more. And then something happens mid-June 2013, the Snowden revelations. And Snowden revelations say, yes, we are under surveillance. And suddenly people go a lot more, a lot less, sorry, a lot less to Wikipedia to learn about terrorism. It is still 100% legal to go and read Wikipedia articles about terrorism but people change their behavior and they go less and less and over time as it decreases, they don't go to Wikipedia anymore to read about her. They're concerned. Maybe I should not read about that. Maybe it's bad. Maybe I'll get into trouble. So this is exactly why when you are under surveillance, you, ch you change your behavior. And mo in most cases, you don't even realize. You think about going, you know, see the Hamas or Al-Qaeda or whatever uh, page on Wikipedia, and then, oh, no, I'll go, I'll go see some kittens instead. You see? It really is uh, that just tiny moment when you change your mind. And, and so the question is, should, should we get rid of, of the, these wonderful bicycles for the mind? And, and my answer is no. My answer is no. So what do we do instead? So in my book, I explain seven principles to build systems that allow people to regain uh, control of their future, of their digital future. Um, and I'll go through these. First one do not rely on targeted advertising as a business model. Otherwise, it won't work. Because that's, that's the whole thing. Google and Facebook, their businesses are just about doing targeted advertising. This is why they gather so much data. They want to know everything about you so that you always stay with them and they can sell targeted advertising to advertisers about you. So do not use targeted advertising as a business model if you're building something. Second is rely on hardware you can control. 
either you self-host uh, your computing and your cloud computing, or you delegate this to a third party you can trust and that you can pay because the, the third party won't do it for free and they won't be able to uh, rely on targeted advertising, principle number one. So you need to give hard cash to the people who run the, the hardware, buy the hardware and run the hardware. And also it's decentralized. It has to be decentralized. Otherwise, we're getting into the same issue as Google and Facebook. Number three, use free and open source software. Why? Because you have access to the source code, so you can audit it or have someone audit the code for you. Um, it's transparent. You know what the code is doing, and it's adaptable. You can change it to fit your needs. You're not at the mercy of uh, someone who decides for you what to do with the code. Number four is use encryption so that the data is safe when it travels from one point to the other and where it is stored. Number five, um, have a great user experience. When you build something, and I know you're working on, hard, on that hard uh, at Nextcloud and you have a special designer that helps you building the apps and that's really, really important, um, having a great user experience. People will not leave Google Drive for a terribly looking product. They want a nice experience. They want something that is nice and cool and pleasant. Um, number six, interoperability thanks to standards. If we start building new uh, systems with diversity, we need to be interoperable. Otherwise, people will stick with Google Drive because, you know, pretty much Everyone needs to interface with Google Drive when they build a product. So you need to make sure we are being interoperable. And finally, a killer feature. Something that makes the product so sexy, so cool, so innovative, that people will look at Google Drive and say, Jesus, you're still using Google Drive? That's terrible. You know, you can't do this or that. Now, it's tricky. It's easier to say than do, right? But we need to find something. And, it, and, and there are many different solutions. Um, and this is something I'm going to discuss now. Um, and this is, so this is a slide I, uh, I, I have in pretty much all my presentation. It's not something I did today to please you guys. Uh, and actually, Nextcloud is always the top of my list. And Cozy is the last one, so they remember Cozy better. <laughs> um, and so I, I list, you know, different projects uh, that do something uh, which is in, this, in, in these seven principles. Uh, next cloud being number one, uh, Solid, um, which is uh, led by uh, no one uh, else than Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. It's an MIT uh, project, very uh, promising. There is a French-Belgian uh, project called Why You Know Host, uh, which is also uh, free software. It's a uh, self-hosting solution. And Cozy Cloud, and, and a few others that are being created and then that are dead, uh, you know, because not everybody succeeds, and that's, that's a fact of life. Um, I will give you a few, uh, few words about uh, Cozy Cloud so that you understand better what it is. Just like uh, Nextcloud, it enables you to sync all your devices. But what makes it very different that we put a lot of focus on having connectors that allow you to import data from the various sources. You know, all the brands that have information about you. Is it your energy provider? Is it your bank? Is it your sh shopping service? Is it LinkedIn, Amazon, uh, whatever? Um, and import that data on your personal cloud. Data that can be accessed from all your devices. And then we put apps that are data-oriented apps. Now that you have data in a single point, which is yours, under your control, what are you going to do? And this is where we need to be uh, creative. Um, 
What, what we do here is we enable uh, brands to create apps that can interact with data locally without getting a copy. We do not allow them to get a copy of the data. But they can offer uh, uh, service uh, that are tailored, customized for the, uh, for the user. So the difference is we are both open source and decentralized. One major difference is that Cozy is absolutely single user. So in, in, in this, we're not uh, competing at all. It's a very strong differentiator. Cozy is not for groups, it's for individuals. You can have several individuals next to each other on, an, on the same machine. You can share files if you want between them, but basically you will see it's a single user, just like a smartphone is a single user uh, device. And we also have ability to run third-party third apps in Cozy. Uh, I'll do a very, very quick demo. I don't know how much time I have, I think. Not much? Okay, because that's because we started really late. Ah. Um, I, I'll, I'll go very quick for, for the demo. So, as I said, single user, you, you go to a specific URL, which is yours, and only yours. And so we don't ask you for a username. We just ask you for a password. If you have the password, you are the person. Just like on your smartphone, you type a code and you're the person. Because you have the device and you have the code. There you have the URL and you have the, the, the password until so you can um, log in. Um, and so this is, this is a, a set of screenshots that I did yesterday. It's the current product, uh, but it's not a live demo because I don't trust Wi-Fi uh, in places like that. Um, so it's a, it's a drive, uh, you know, uh, just like you imagine, you have folders, you have files. Uh, and you have a button on top right, which is apps, which is a list of apps uh, that we are working on. And so I'm going to uh, Cozy Photos. Uh, you have the photos, you have a, a, an album feature. Uh, and once you go into an album, uh, you can also uh, share it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to another app uh, now, uh, which is the uh, Cozy Collect app, which is the, the connectors um, application. So I have different uh, categories of, uh, of uh, connectors. Uh, here, this is the list of connectors to, connect, uh, to collect my uh, phone bills. So I can pick of the friend, this is for with French operators, but uh, so I could import data from uh, these uh, mobile operators. Uh, I need to uh, give to Cozy a username uh, and password. And as you may see here, it says import your bills. It just import your bills, but uh, we'll see. Um, this is the uh, French electricity provider. And it's different here. You can import a lot more uh, than just your bills. You can import your bills, your contacts, contracts, sorry, your consumption, your uh, client profile, and your home information. And all the information, the files here, the, the, uh, the bills are collected and put into a specific folder of your drive. So it's a lot easier to access your bills from your mobile operator, electricity provider, and, and such. Um, and now uh, we will go to the bank's uh, application uh, where you can see, sorry, this one is not uh, localized into English yet. Uh, you can see uh, how much money you have in your bank. It, connects to, it can connect to several banks, different banks, and do a, a global view also, which is uh, very interesting if you have multiple bank accounts. Um, and I can see I have um, a bill here, which is um, about... Uh, um, a phone, it's a phone bill, and I have a link here. And if I click on the link, it takes me to the PDF that is automatically downloaded by the connector. So I can really access my data very quickly from my bank account to my bills. Um, another example, and this is very uh, French-like, um, if I click on the health expense, it will take me to this application, and the, the, the French system uh, for health reimbursement is very complicated. You have a state insurance 
that gives you back money. When you spend money for, you go to a doctor, you spend the money. And then uh, the state insurance will, social insurance will give you back some money, but not generally not 100% of it. It will give you a share, just a share. And you get the money on your bank account. And you can track whether you've been reimbursed by the state insurance or not. And then on top of that, you have a secondary insurance that will add another sum to that. And it really makes it complicated to track. I went to that doctor and that day, I have been compensated by the state insurance or not. And so have I been compensated by the secondary insurance or not? Um, and then you can track, there is this application that enables you, uh, so you can see you've been two sources here of reimbursement, and you can see what has been reimbursed and what has not yet been reimbursed. This is pretty much it. Uh, well, thank you very much, and I hope we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Questions, Frank. So, um, thanks for the great talk, first of all. Really, really impressive. Um, so I think um, most of uh, the people here in the room agree with you that privacy is really important. Um, but it seems that a lot of people out there don't care that much about it. I mean, the Snowden revelations are out for a while now. And there are some people who think about it, but the majority not. So what, what can we do to basically um, push this forward to, to, to tell people that, is, that I should care, that I really should think about alternatives? Because at the moment, I think it seems that like 90% of the people don't give a crap. I mean, I just are fine with the situation as it is today. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, that's a question. Um, what can we do if people don't care about privacy? Um, well, first, I've done my share. Uh, I wrote that book, uh, which explains what I explained to you this morning. And by the way, if you know of a good publisher in Germany, uh, maybe we can translate it into German and, and, and uh, you know, sell it here. It's, uh, by the way, I give all my money to, uh, to a nonprofit that promotes privacy in France with you know, my money I made with the, with the book. So I'm do, not doing it for the money. Uh, but I think it does. The topic is really important. So um, explaining, teaching, I give talks. I, I get invited on radios and TVs, and I'm, I do all of that. I do a lot of evangelization on this topic. And I think I preach to the dessert, more or less. <laughs> People, well, there is some interest. The book is selling pretty well. Uh, I wish I could do more. Um, the second thing, and, and, and by writing the book, it's telling people, but also explaining to people that already understand, is giving them arguments about this, how to explain it to people that privacy matters. So you know it, you, you feel, you feel like privacy is important, but if you, if you read about it, then you'll be better at explaining why it's, it's, it's important. So, so what I am doing, it's, it's basically what I did with Firefox, you know. I'm explaining Firefox to, I used to explain Firefox is really cool and you should use it because Internet, Internet Explorer is crap and all of that. Um, and I would explain that to people and, and they would explain that to others. And they would install Firefox on somebody else's machine, you know, and, and stuff like that. Um, the, the second thing, we need to do is build great products. It's build alternative products that are really cool. And this is exactly what you guys are doing. Uh, build uh, a very good next cloud experience so that people will say, yeah, I love it. I, I, yeah, data is, uh, is on a server, you know, Google's not reading our data and, uh, and all of that. So building a great product is the second way of, of uh, doing that. Because it's true, not so many people care about uh, privacy, but they do care about good user experience. That, that it really works. Uh, you may remember how Google won over Yahoo and Alta Vista at the time. It was just better. And, and people didn't know about Google until someone came and said, oh, you know, you should, 
you should use Google because Yahoo and Alta Vista, they are such craps compared to Google. And so they started using Google search. And even before that, I remember vividly remember what you're still using Mosaic as a web browser. You should totally use Netscape. It's so much better. And then it was Internet Explorer, so much better. And then it went Firefox, so much better. And now Chrome is so much better. <coughs> no, I'm ju just just kidding. <laughs> okay, so no, building building better products is is the is is the way to do. And by the way, Firefox is better, but you know that. You should try otherwise. Did I respond to your question? Yeah. I wish I had a, a magic button we could press, and then that we went, but I don't. Is there in, another question? Yes, I'm, I, I'm, I'm listening and I'll repeat the question. So. Uh, that's, uh, that's another very good question, and I, I'm, I don't think you would like the answer. Uh, so, the, and I'll repeat the question first because I think people uh, that are watching us on the internet, how do we balance uh, the need of uh, police forces and government uh, to um, uh, prevent uh, terror attacks? Um, is that properly summarized? So, first, I have nothing against police forces, right? I am I'm not someone who dreams of being without police forces or anything. Uh, I don't hate them. Um, I'm, I have even people like that in my family, so that I'm, I'm totally fine, and I still talk to them. So, really, uh, no worries. Now, there is one thing, major thing, and it's hard to understand because we do not think but we feel about terror. We feel, but we don't think. Let's just remember that the chances of being killed or harmed by a terror attack is less frequent than being killed by a light storm, right? It really, statistically, it never happens. But when it does happen, we talk to it about, we talk about it a lot, so it, it puts a, la a, a big impression of us. And, and, and I hate terrorism. I, I think it's an, it's an acceptable. But the, the risk and the perception that we have are extremely different. The risk is very, very, very low. But this is what we talk about all day long in the news, right? And this is putting our society in, in a difficult situation. And that's, I would say, it's the beauty of terrorism. It works because it's scary. And it's more scary than effective. And actually, it's actually, it's effective because it's scary. But it's not effective at killing people. Right? So it, I, I, this is something which is not a very popular view, but it needs to be said. Um, and then, um, putting mass surveillance systems on society is actually helping terrorism winning. They hate our values, they hate what we do, the way we live, they hate our freedoms. And if we start reducing our freedoms because of them, they have been succeeding. And it's not something that we want. So I, I am totally okay with police forces having targeted targeted surveillance about suspects. I don't think having mass surveillance is what is going to make the Western society a good society. So let's, let's sure not to, uh, we have an expression in French, let's not throw away the baby with the bath water. Um, you know, uh, 
we need to address terrorism, is terrorism issues, but we no, do not need, we do not, we should not do mass surveillance because it's going to make all of us um, very unhappy. You, you have to remember that because we tell, we tend to self-censor under mass surveillance, means that the creative people, the people that want to change the world, they will not emerge. And the world will stay as it is. And I don't think the world is really great right now. I don't think the inequalities between people in society is good. And if we put mass surveillance in effect, dissidence will disappear. And dissidence is progress. That's it. Do we have a third question? Or was, uh, was I too scary? <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Thank you for doing stuff for privacy. And so your question is, is it, is it, have we lost? Yes. Have we lost the privacy battle because, so let, let me maybe uh, summarize your question. Uh, have we lost the privacy battle because anyway, websites use Google Analytics and Google AdSense and AdWords and, um, and stuff like that? Yeah, maybe. But maybe we have. Maybe we don't know we've lost. Uh, and maybe we haven't lost. Maybe, maybe it's hard. I don't know. It certainly is hard, right? But maybe it's just, just a difficult moment of this. Um, I don't know. But I know that we should not have the perfect solution to start using it. Um, if, if there is one thing I have learned during my Mozilla years, um, is that you, um, you know, in, in Mozilla things in, in '98 uh, and 2003, uh, the early years of, the, of Mozilla uh, and Firefox, it was it was terrible. You know, my job at the time was being an evangelist, who I, I was trying to promote web standards uh, to websites who told me, yeah, I use the standards, I use Internet Explorer, which is a standard, right? And you know, we, they were building websites for Internet Explorer and with, with all the bugs of Internet Explorer, and they were happy with the bugs because they were used to the bugs, and they know this feature, you, sh you shouldn't use it because it's buggy and all that. And, and we had like 0% market share. Uh, and and that, was, that was terribly distressing to do that. But in the end, uh, we've won. That, that's that one thing we've learned, uh, is that you can build the future you want. You, you are, I think, a developer, or at least a fan. You, you understand technology. You can change the world, because you can, you can write free software, which, which is distributed for free on the internet. It's amazing. You're building tools, and they can spread. You have a lot of power. It's not easy, and you should use an ad blocker, by the way. You know, because really, th this, is, this is easy, and you should everyone, tell everyone around you to use an ad blocker. I used to say not, use it, not to use an ad blocker, but I think we need to resist the advertising business now. Because it's, it's like cancer to privacy. And keep 
Keep doing what you do. Do we have time for another question? Or yes, last last one then. Um, I don't know, I, I use Firefox, which last, last time I checked was not owned by Google. Um, I use uh, uBlock Origin, uh, which is free software. And if you use Firefox and uBlock Origin, you're a lot, lot safer uh, than pretty much anyone else. Uh, you can try uh, Privacy Badger, you can try Disconnect.me and stuff like that. Um, and you should, you should totally not use Chrome. That's for sure, you know. Uh, maybe you don't know, but Chrome takes all your uh, browser history and sends it back to Google. So what's the point in using an ad blocker if your browsing history is sent to Google? So stop using Chrome. Uh, and, or maybe try Chromium if you want, but you should really give a try to Firefox if you don't use it. And use uBlock Origin with it, and you'll be like, you've done like 90% of the job just by doing that, and it, it's easy, really. So that was the last question. Thank you very much.